You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast. I left to start my career in New York, started out as a journalist working for CNN. I first transitioned into entrepreneurship when I met my first business partner in Kenya and started a production studio and launched a show called The XYZ Show in Nairobi. So I work a lot with development finance institutions like IFC, the private arm of the World Bank, the French AFD and Poparco or Afrexin Bank to help them shape their strategy to invest in the creative sector. If you want want to enter the global market, you have to understand how you need to shape your output. And again, that's valid for everyone around the world. Stay tuned as we bring you inspiring people who are unlocking Africa's economic potential. You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast with your host, Tessa Adamu. Welcome to the Unlocking Africa podcast, where we find amazing people who are doing amazing things to unlock Africa's economic potential. Today, we have another special guest, Marie Laura Mungai, who is the founder and CEO of Restless Global, which is a strategic advisory and content development company specialized in the African entertainment space. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the podcast, Marie. How are you? I'm very good, Tersus. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really glad to be to be here. Fantastic. It's great to have you on the podcast because we have been speaking for the good part of almost a year about what you do and having a conversation on the podcast. And the date is finally here. So it's great to have you, Marie. Yes, I'm, I'm glad we're finally able to make it work. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So I know you've listened before, so you know that I like to start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping you could introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about Marie. Sure. So people are often curious about my journey because I'm originally from France, but I've been working in Africa now for about 20 years. And so people often wonder how I ended up there. So I'm used to telling the story, but basically the story is that so I'm from Paris in France. I went to an international middle school and high school as a child and then did my studies between France and the U.S. Uh, but I was already surrounded by people from, you know, all sorts of cultures and people from all over the world growing up. So I didn't have a typical French upbringing. And then as soon as I could leave, I left to start my career in New York. Uh, I started out as a journalist working for CNN, and that was great. And then after a couple of years of doing this, I decided that I wanted to be in the field and meet real people, living real things and cover real stories, because I was aware that the life of, in New York was not exactly the life that everybody lived. And because I was bilingual in French and English, I thought that Africa would be a very wide continent where I could apply my skills and some friend recommended that I should go to Kenya and I didn't know anything about Kenya. I barely knew anything about Africa in general but I decided to move there so I moved to Nairobi in January of 2006 and I moved without a job so I quit my job at CNN and I said hey if you want to find me I'll be in Nairobi. I went around all the different news outlets in the US and in France. And I called ahead in Nairobi and saying, so I'm going to be arriving. This is what I know how to do. And as soon as I arrived, I basically found a lot of work thanks to my language skills and of course coming from CNN. So I got a lot of work straight away and I ended up working as a foreign correspondent for a few years, covering a dozen countries based out of Kenya. And then that's from where I transitioned into more what I'm doing now. I first transitioned into entrepreneurship when I met uh, my business partner, my first business partner in Kenya and started a production studio and launched a show called The XYZ Show in Nairobi that is basically a political satire show with puppets. Yes. Yeah. In the UK, you have spitting image, Yes, right? yes. <laughs> so it's exactly the same thing. And it kind of had the same impact in that it became huge and very popular. Uh, so that kind of took over my life and his life and everybody's life around us. And so we built a full-fledged production studio with 80 people around it. That still exists in Kenya. That company is still there, still producing content. 
Uh, we've done 14 seasons of that show. Uh, and then I started other companies. So in the midst of all this, I got married to a Kenyan. Uh, we moved together to Los Angeles when he went to film school. We're divorced now. And so being exposed to a little bit of the tech scene in California and the beginning of Netflix, then I thought, hmm, Mobile connections are really blowing up in Africa. There's a growing need for content. And so that led me to launch one of the first VOD services on the continent back in 2012. So more than 10 years ago now, way too early for the market. But that was called Buni TV. Buni TV was acquired four years later by, by Trace Media Group. Then I also launched a talent management agency. So I had all this entrepreneurial journey with successes and failures like any entrepreneur. And then about seven years ago, I decided to really focus on what I saw as being the most impactful thing that I could do would be to really be the go-between between international sources of funding or people who could make things happen and entrepreneurs in the creative space in the continent. And so I started my current business, Restless Global, which, as you said, is an advisory firm. And so I work a lot with, for example, development finance institutions like IFC, the private arm of the World Bank, the French AFD and Proparco or Afrexin Bank or AFDB to help them shape their strategy to invest in the creative sector and then to drive these strategies. So I work as a creative sector expert for these type of institutions. And also I work for private companies that want to expand their activities across the continent in sports, in um, you know the audiovisual sector, in fashion. And so that's really what I see as my mission is to help support the growth of the creative sector in, in Africa by bringing in these resources from around the world and helping them focus on you know, the right opportunities, the right entrepreneurs and the right companies. Fantastic. Wow. It's quite clear that you've had a colorful, diverse and impactful career outside and inside Africa, which has led you to Africa and launching Restless Global. And I guess the mission of Restless Global or one of the missions is stated as Africa is the final frontier for a global media industry seeking growth or to expand. I was wondering if you could elaborate on the point or the meaning behind that statement in terms of why Africa holds such significance in the context of the media industry's expansion. Sure. Um, well, first of all, as a market for any kind of industry, as we all know, and, and I guess that that's what we're all trying to fight against, is that Africa is very often the last market that companies are looking at addressing on the global scale, just because of the level of development, the purchasing power of the population. So even a Netflix, for example, that is now in a couple markets in Africa, they took their time to arrive and it was not a priority for a long time. And even now they're on the continent, but it's not necessarily a priority. That's just because of the numbers. However, we also all know that it's a very, very large continent uh, with a lot of people, 1.3, 1.4 now. And when it comes to the creative sector, nobody can deny that there is really a depth and diversity of creative output in Africa that is unparalleled around the world. This, you know, has been the case forever. So African creativity has inspired the arts around the world forever, whether it is music and the influence of African beats in blues and jazz in the US and hip hop, or in the visual arts, the impact that African art had on, on prominent global artists such as Picasso, for example, with the, you know, getting inspiration from African sculptures. So this has always been around. There are things now that have changed. One important one is that we're now all connected through technology and through yes. social media, which means that there's now a direct line between audiences worldwide. Before you had to go through middlemen and through you know people who would select things or curate or frame things in a certain way. Right now, you don't have that anymore. It's direct. So that changes a lot of things. That changes access to audience, that changes exposure, that changes the whole discourse. And so the interactions are changing and there's a lot more power that now stands on the side of the person who originates whatever creative output it is. So the balance is shifting. And also we've had uh, collectively in the world a bit of a reckoning over you know, what it means, intellectual property, exploitative practices, and who 
to credit for what. So there's been all these movements, even in the U.S. with Last Matter, Oscar So White, Me Too for Women. And so now around the world, a lot of people, especially in the creative industries, are a lot more aware of giving credit to the artist. And so all these big movements, for me, the position African and African creators at the tipping point where really now we have all the elements for, you know, explosive growth. And it's a matter of accessing them and putting them in the right order, in the right place, so that we can benefit from what's in front of us. So that's really why I think that this market is very exciting and, and primed for a lot of growth. Thank you for that, Marie. You touched on a key point that Africa is often the last market that companies tend to prioritise, but also detailed that the rest of the world is starting to see the creative and commercial potentials of Africa's creative industries. So I was wondering from your experience, what opportunities does this present in the African continent? It presents a lot of opportunities. So sometimes, uh, you know, I speak to creatives and they are complaining, oh, people are not listening to us or they're not giving us space. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that uh, there's a lack of desire any side here, what's going on in Africa. I think now what comes with universal access through digital means and social media and the internet. Uh, now we have another issue is the issue of discovery and, uh, you know, matching the people looking for something and the people delivering that thing. So that's one challenge. So sometimes it's just, it might be people interested in what you do, but they cannot find you. So that's one thing. And the second thing is we're in a global environment, right? So if we want to, and that works for everyone, not just people from Africa, but people from around the world. If you want to participate in a market that is global, you have to play by the rules of the global market. So let's say if you are in agriculture and you want to export beans, there's a certain set of rules and criteria that you need to match for your beans to go into that market, that market, that market. Uh, Well, when we talk about creative output, there are some as well. Uh, Some of them are, you know, how to package and market your content, how to develop your content. For example, how to write a script that is written following the convention of storytelling that are required to go and access a global audience. So there's certain things like that, which doesn't mean that it negates uh, local authenticity. And that's always the balance that every creator has to find. But If you want to enter the global market, you have to understand how you need to shape your output. And again, that's valid for everyone around the world. Uh, And sometimes I give that example of, so I, I haven't lived in France for 20 years and I've never worked in France, but I attempted a few years ago to create a TV series there and just trying to, because I'm so you know, Americanized and I've, I only work in English and I understand the, you know, the the Anglo-Saxon way of thinking. Um, and for me, trying to shape myself into a writer that would write a series in the way that French people would want, both in the writing and in the collaborating with people there. And I was a complete disaster. <laughs> I could not understand <laughs> the rules. We were not understanding each other. I could not even talk to producers properly. I didn't understand my role. And mind you, I've done that in various markets in the English language many times, but in France, I was lost. So it works for everyone. You want to enter a market, you need to understand the rules. And so I think that the maybe the challenge, that's the challenge we have now, which is not at all a challenge that, that is impossible to overcome. And, you know, how do you make yourself discoverable? And how do you package what is it that you have to say or to create for the audience that you're trying to reach? Fantastic. So I find it quite interesting. I mean, I agree 100% in what you said. In order to access these opportunities, we need to promote these African stories and individuals so that they can be discovered. So with the work that you do, can you give us, obviously without mentioning any names, any examples that you've seen where people have successfully promoted themselves or stories to access some of these global opportunities that are started to present themselves to African creatives? There are many. There are many. Obviously, the, the obvious ones that we all know about are movements now, you know, Afrobeats, Nollywood, everybody talks about that. There's now a piano from South Africa. There will be more music genres from the continent. Music is an interesting subsector because it's probably the most 
approachable. And it's the one that travels the most and easier because you don't really need to understand a culture to appreciate the sound. Right. Uh, you don't really you don't need to understand the language that the artist is singing in. You need to be able to respond to the mood and to the vibe and to the beat. And so that that is a type of art that has traveled widely. We can also see the success of K-pop from South Korea. I don't think any one of us speaks Korean, uh, but a lot of us might want to listen to K-pop or all the Latin music. Well, might not speak Spanish or Portuguese, but of course there is a beat there and there is value culturally that a lot of people can respond to. So it's the same with some African music genres, and those have had a lot of success. I think that There's a lot more that can be done. And I think it is going to happen because you now have a lot of people working on that. You have a lot of big players from the music industry, whether there are platforms or there are labels that are very aware of this opportunity and they are in Africa and they are looking for talent and they're organizing big concerts and promoting these talents. You know that there's playlists of African music now and all the Spotify's and Apple Music and all the likes. Billboard has a chart for Afrobeats now. So it's happening, right? So that's one genre that I would say subsect of the creative industries that has been successful and can be even more successful. I think the next one now is content production, with Nollywood being the example that we all have in mind. It has not traveled as much as music yet, but we know that when a title is successful on Netflix, very often it is successful in many countries around the world and not just around Africa. Uh, we can see that typically Latin America responds quite well. Uh, to this kind of storytelling. There's a few titles that have been, you know, at the top of the charts in Europe or the US. And it doesn't have to be just Nollywood. I think there is also new content from South Africa. I'm just mentioning yes. Nigeria and South Africa for, for Netflix because that's where they are, right? So we're yes. limited. But uh, recently I saw Unseen, which is a new series on Netflix produced in South Africa by Gambit Films, uh, which is a fantastic production company. It's a crime drama about a cleaning lady that normally nobody sees. And because of circumstances and looking for her husband, she finds herself in a situation where she kills somebody. Yes. Uh, and then things just spiral out of control. Spiral I've, out of control. <laughs> I've watched it. <laughs> exactly. And you see, I thought it was very, very well done. And and also the way that Netflix is promoting its international content is by genre, right? So they're like, yes. if you like, you know, crime dramas, you will like this and this and this. They don't tell you, oh, watch this stuff from South Africa, or watch this stuff from Nigeria. And that's very smart because then then that's how you discover things from other countries. So I love crime dramas, um, you know, or crime thrillers. So I will literally watch that genre from anywhere in the world. I don't care. And I had heard of Unseen, but I didn't go specifically looking for it. I, it just was offered to me. And I thought it was great. So we're, we're going to see more of these things uh, happening. Uh, I think that in the field of literature, you know, there's a lot of African yes. writers who have won awards, who are read around the world. I mean, Chimamanda Adishi is the most well-known. There yeah. are many, many of those. And so I actually think that African creatives are doing very well. It's it's really the issues again. How do you get discovered? Yes. Uh, how do you improve your craft so that it's it's what will emerge from the mass of things that are being created? But I'm one of these people who is very optimistic about where we stand. Definitely. Yes, I'm optimistic as well because you detailed the huge success of obviously Nollywood, Afrobeat, I'm a Piano, and they've achieved huge global appeal. So, would it be safe to say that African music or culture are the biggest exports the continent currently has? And do you think we fully leverage its power to propel Africa forward? That's a great question. Um, so, of course, if you speak to somebody who works in energy or, um, you know, <laughs> or, or uh, extracting, you know, resources, they'll tell you, no, Africa's first resource is whatever. It's, it's, you know, it's petrol, it's gold, it's diamonds, it's culture and whatever. Africa is super rich in a lot of resources. OK, uh, one of them just being also its people, um, yes. uh, even if we don't look at culture specifically, but you go to all the top business schools and universities in the world, you will find a ton of Africans there. Yes. Um, and actually, when I was still a journalist and uh, doing some stories in the U.S., I did a story on 
how the demographics with the highest percentage of the advanced degrees in the U.S. It's not the Asians, it's the African immigrants. Yes. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't need to explain to any of your listeners, but really the premium that's put on education on the continent, you know, it's it's huge. It's unthinkable that parents would be like, oh, whatever, like the school, not important. Don't study, just, you know, go with the flow. No. Uh, people have to study. Uh, people have to succeed intellectually as much as, as they can. So that's one of the first exports of Africa is really its, its brains, right? But culture and it, the creative arts are another. As I said, it's not new at all. It's been it's been like that for centuries. And I don't think we're exploiting it enough, indeed. So, of course, the question is, okay, if you're if you're a government, if you're a country, what should you focus on? Should you focus on feeding your people and providing security if you have, you know, some, some issues? Should you focus on education, as we just said? Everything is a priority. But my argument is that actually culture and the creative arts and sports should also be seen as a priority, which, by the way, do not necessarily necessitate massive investments from government. Sometimes it just needs we just need them to get out of the way yes. um, and maybe appoint people who uh, know about these sectors uh, in key positions, such as, you know, we see too many ministries of, of cultures in Africa where they are headed by somebody who's a pharmacist, for example. I've seen yes. that personally. Um, why? Uh, I don't know. They're friends with somebody. But that is, that is you know, very short-sighted because to put somebody uh, in this position who is someone who understands the sector just through fostering communication and relationships and opening doors uh, and connecting people, they can have a huge impact. And it's very important for African countries to understand the potential of their creative industries, because this is really how uh, soft power emerges. And at the moment, as you know, African countries are very low on soft power. Yes. So some of them don't have a reputation at all. Some of them have a negative reputation. A few have a good reputation now in modern times, such as Rwanda, such as Mauritius. And Morocco is also emerging as quite a well-governed country. So a few of them have understood that, but most of them are not doing much about it. Unfortunately, the, my country where I work the most, Nigeria, has been historically not very good at that, even though, you know, it's just the, one of the wealthiest when it comes to culture. Yes. But that's not what people know outside of the continent about Nigeria. They know lots of negative things, but they don't necessarily know how rich it is in terms of the creative arts. So why is it important? Is that these are the most inspirational aspects of a country. And by leveraging the inspirational aspect of the artists and the athletes of a specific country, then you raise the profile and you make the country attractive to others. Yes. You make the country a lot more attractive to investors who might want to support the other sectors that we mentioned before, like education and health and infrastructure and agriculture. And so these things are directly related. Uh, you also increase you know, interest in tourism when you invest in the creative sector. So it is really acting as a magnet for everything else. And again, my position is that I'm not advocating that African governments should suddenly avail billions of dollars for that. There's lots of smart ways to think about it, lots of things that you can leverage just to, to generate that spark, right? And so, yeah, I think that that's definitely an area that can be um, improved. I agree 100%, Marie. I'm a big believer in soft power and utilization for contributing to other elements of the economy, as you mentioned before, tourism, trade, and investment in other sectors. So from the perspective of, say, African government policies, from your experience of the work that you do, what components or elements do you think would contribute to the development of an effective, say, soft power strategy? So there's a few. Uh, some of them I've written about. So in 2021, I published a report for UNESCO on, on the African film and audiovisual sector. Yes. And yeah, I looked at every single one of the 54 countries on the continent wow. in detail. And, you know, the, the legal and regulatory framework was for the, the film industry. But very often it's very tightly linked to what the, the framework is for the creative sector in general. Um, so it's quite weak, right, in terms of framework. So interestingly, most countries have 
pretty solid copyright law. So, so you know, people talk a lot about piracy and yes, it's a problem, but actually legally the work was done like this is a framework. But when it comes to promoting and encouraging the creative sector, now we don't really have much guidelines. So I already mentioned appointing somebody in positions of influence, ministries or others that actually know the sector as one thing that costs nothing and would be really impactful. Another one is passing a creative bill that really shapes, you know, the ambition of the country for the creative sector and sets goals to achieve and timelines. So I know that Nigeria right now is debating its creative bill. It's quite important. So that's really just to get people aligned on some objectives. So that's something that also costs nothing. Other things that can be done is instead of putting money in, because again, I recognize that there might not be much extra cash available, what governments can do is really try to not take money out. We know that in many African countries, there are taxes everywhere. Like every 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 time yes. there's an opportunity to add a tax, the governments like to do that. There's been lots of debates a couple of years ago in Nigeria where suddenly the government was putting a new tax on the film industry at every step of the way. And then it just became, one, a headache and two, impossible to make money for people in the sector. So if you're trying to support a sector, adding taxes everywhere it doesn't help. You can just, you know, take a step back. So get rid of taxes on the import of equipment, for example. Allow for a moratorium of two to three years for people starting a creative company. You can also make investments in certain creative activities tax deductible. For example, if a company wants to become a, a sponsor of the arts and um, uh, maybe uh, buy local art from a painter or create a sculpture for, for the company's lobby or invest in a after-school program for the arts, all these things could be very easily tax deductible and encourage a lot of private money going into the space. You can also um, organize a festival or a conference, a leading event where you showcase something from your country that you're particularly good at and you attract the rest of the world to it. So, for example, Senegal has the Biennale in Dakar. It's very well-known rendezvous for the visual art world. People come to the country during that moment in time and it really contributes to improving the image of the country. Senegal is doing very well, actually, when it comes to soft power through the art. Another important one is to really leverage the power of the diaspora. Um, yes. The African diaspora is very strong. As I said, usually they're extremely well educated. A lot of them have reached positions of influence in large companies. They all want to support and give back and come back and be involved. And so maintaining tight connections with them, inviting them to events, maybe helping them to invest, encouraging them to open their networks. Uh, this is really a strength as well that costs nothing. And that would be a shame not to work with. So, yeah, all of these things will have a huge impact. Fantastic. So you detailed the, the components that would contribute to the development of a comprehensive and effective soft power strategy and how that links to the report or the project you collaborated with UNESCO. So when it comes to that report or the project that you delivered, what were some of the positive outcomes that came out of that? A lot. I think that it was actually um, quite a seminal report. That's why I wanted to work on it. It was a lot of work, as you can imagine. But it was very important at several levels. Uh, first of all, uh, nobody had attempted to do that at that scale before. So we had you know, some information about the audiovisual industry in some countries here and there, but nobody had looked at the entire continent from every angle. And so suddenly that's where you start seeing what exactly is happening. So it's very, it's a report that's super useful for everyone. It's useful for governments. Uh, they can see how they're faring compared to others. They can see what others are doing that might be a good idea that they can reproduce. It's very useful for investors because there's numbers in there, you know. Uh, you know, we, we counted the number of, of cinemas that exist. We tried to estimate the number of people employed in each industry. So local governments helped us and 
and share their numbers with us. So if you're an investor, suddenly it's much easier to determine, okay, should I go to Ivory Coast or should I go to Senegal? Or should I go to Togo? If you want to go in Francophone Africa, for example, there are the names of all the main players within the report. So again, let's say if you're a producer from Germany and you, you want to shoot a film in Namibia, as you know, Namibia and Germany share a common history, then you might find your leads to your production partner in this report. So it's a very actionable compilation of data and the impact that it had. So it got a lot of press. And then there was a lot of things that happened after that. So UNESCO and Netflix partnered to launch a project to support six African filmmakers to do an anthology of folk tales stories. So they actually were just released, I think, last month on Netflix. Uh, so that was a very concrete example. But I also note that UNESCO got approached by a lot of African governments who said, OK, we've seen the report. We want to engage around some of these ideas and please have help us maybe review our creative bill or start developing a film incentive policy. And that's the work that UNESCO does. So that really encouraged a lot of these new conversations. And I have to say that it's also been helpful for a lot of foreign investors and producers. Um, I get approached by a lot of these people who want to understand the continent. And I don't have to repeat myself. I can just send them the link <laughs> and say to them, okay, first read this and you know, read about the countries you might be interested in. And if you don't find your, your response in there, then we can talk. But I'm pretty sure you will find what you need. Yeah, and, and this continues. And I actually wish that, you know, this kind of projects could be launched and financed for all of the creative sectors, you know, for music, for fashion. And another thing that I should mention, I do a lot of these reports, right? I do a lot of these market studies and analysis for a lot of my clients. Most of those stay private, meaning that the commissioner of the report will keep the results for themselves and not share. I do not understand this approach. Um, you know, if you're a development institution, why would you not want everybody else who has the same goal as you to have access to the same information so yes. that you can collaborate and have the most impact? I don't understand. But so that is what was different with UNESCO. They made it public. That's what they do, right? They do thought leadership and then they make it available. And that changes everything. So I wish that others would commission similar type reports and then share them with everyone. Thank you for sharing that. I guess for me, I love the idea of generating these reports and projects. And I'm glad to hear that there's been positive outcomes from your report because a lot of the times what we tend to see is reports and not much action or activity afterwards and a lack of actually implementing the idea. So it's great to hear that there's some positive and fruitful activities that have come out of the report. So brilliant. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you mentioned your work, obviously in the tech space, you spent some time with living in California. Mm -hmm. And also you have your work, which is quite evident in the creative industry. So I wanted to kind of understand in terms of within Africa, we are seeing a clear tech boom and you're quite in the intersection between tech and creative industries. So I wanted to get your understanding in terms of how is this boom in tech shaping or kind of transforming Africa's creative industries? Yeah, it's a very good question as well. I think they are linked. So my own journey with tech is it kind of mirrors the journey of the continent because the, uh, I mentioned I, I had launched this video on, on demand service in 2012. And 2012 was really the early beginning I was in Kenya at the time of the Silicon Savannah, right? Yes. Uh, because Kenya was, I'd say, the first country to be really proactive in the tech space. And there was the first tech hubs there and the first accelerators and all of that. So I was very much part of that crowd. And um, to give a sense, I don't know if you have maybe younger uh, listeners, but there was literally nothing at the time. It was yes. impossible to find an engineer. Maybe some people were trained in school, but nobody had worked on a tech startup before that there was these tech companies didn't even exist. So we were at really ground zero. So finding an engineer um, and a CTO for me was, I was lucky to find one, but it was extremely hard at the time. Building your tech team was so, so hard. And then we didn't have investors. There was no investors. And the ones that were there, they were giving you $10,000 and you can not do anything $10,000. And that was at the time where, you know, the, the the few first investors that were coming to Africa thought, well, this is a poor continent. So we would give maybe 100000 to 
you know, and pre-seed to an entrepreneur in San Francisco, but here we'll we'll give five or ten, and that should be enough. And that really used to enrage me because I didn't understand the context of the type of person in Kenya or elsewhere in Africa who would want to be building these kind of solutions, somebody very educated, most likely they are the most educated in their family, and most likely they are the hope of the entire family. And they are the ones who have to make money to pay school fees for their siblings or their cousins or, you know, pay for the mother to go to the hospital for a checkup. So you cannot make people work for free in Africa. It just doesn't work in the economy. No. You actually have to pay them. You have to pay interns in Africa, not crazy amounts of money, but they otherwise they can't take the bus to come to work. Um, and so these first investors who were just oblivious to the realities, was, that was just driving me mad. But all of this to say that we had nothing. And so I built that first startup. Luckily, um, you know, I did not die doing it uh, and, I, and I had an exit, but it was like very challenging journey. And then I still remain in contact with the tech space very closely as it grew. Very happy to see that now we've reached a stage where we've had some proper evaluations and exits I don't want to make too much out of the fact that Africa has had unicorns because the entire concept of unicorn, uh, you know, has kind of lost its shine in the past six months to one year. So I don't think the goal needs to be uh, creating a company that reaches a, an artificial one billion valuation, but we need to build sustainable companies that actually make revenue, which was always the mindset in Africa. We just lost our way uh, momentarily with the rest of the world for a few, you know, a few months, but. We should be focused on building sustainable companies that provide real results in terms of revenues and jobs and value created. So that has been a journey. And now we're at a stage where you don't struggle. It's always hard to recruit talent, but there are lots of qualified engineers across the continent. There are lots of entrepreneurs who now know how to build a pitch deck. They know how to uh, explain their idea. They know how to talk to investors. They know how to raise money. They know how to iterate on their product. They know... Now they know that has taken about 10, 15 years, right? Yes. And some of these talents that have been shaped by the growth of the tech sector are now coming into other sectors, such as the creative sector or the sports sector, and bringing these modern world practices and business development and management practices uh, into these new sectors. And I would say that the creative sector uh, is probably where the tech sector was maybe not 10 years ago, but maybe seven, five years ago. So we're starting to see the sector structuring itself. We're starting to see entrepreneurs that are more intentional about the way they build their business. And some of that is because of the one, the model that the African tech sector has shown. And then with cross-pollination, you know, people moving from one space to the other. One thing that is exciting for me about Africa is that contrary to other regions of the world, a lot of people love creativity and entertainment in Africa. So you find a lot of tech people who have an interest in the creative sector. You find a lot of investors who have a personal interest in the creative sector, even if they don't understand yet how they can invest for profit in it. You'll find some bankers who maybe have a blog part-time or organize you know, uh, some creative events over the weekend. These people, they exist in Africa, very rare in other markets. So for me, it's a matter of time. And the boom of the tech sector is certainly helping. And I would say we see, of course, companies emerge that are at the intersection of tech and creativity. But it doesn't need to be only that. And that's something I always want to remind people. The brick and mortar businesses are so valid, even more so in an emerging market such as Africa. I'm personally also very much interested in businesses that are you know, more traditional, for example, a mixed used venues. So we don't have spaces to meet for entertainment on the continent. Very few. We have, you know, proper music venues. We don't have like places where you go, you can watch a movie, but also go to a spa, put the kids into some, you know, do some games and have a bite and um, and there's a gym, you know, so there's still a lot of space for these kind of offering. Uh, there's still a lot of space for on the side of manufacturing of creative products, whether they are textile, fashion, design, we don't, you know, we skip the manufacturing stage on the continent. So these things are still lacking and they're still needed. So 
I'm not somebody who will say tech will save the world, right? This is one way to do it. But there's still a lot of things that are worth investing in and building that involve a physical component. So that's also something that I'm looking at. Thank you for that. You mentioned that you're seeing tech people moving into other sectors, such as the creative industry. So I was wondering, what are some of the exciting innovations that you're seeing in that intersection of, say, tech and creativity? Um, Well, so there's a lot. The question is, are they the solutions or business models that will really unlock the potential of the sector for Africa. So I'll explain what I mean. Okay. I was talking about the fact that now, thanks to the internet and social media and all these platforms, African creatives had access to the rest of the world. So, you know, the kind of obvious step is for a lot of people, including myself uh, 15 years ago, is to think, "Mm, let me build a platform for this or for that. So whether it is, you know, video on demand or music streaming or e-commerce, that's kind of what a lot of people think. And these things are needed, but I don't think that they are the end or be all. And also, unfortunately, these kind of solutions necessitate a very high level of investment in terms of money. Uh, and and you, when you're building this kind of solution, you're directly competing with the global giants that's already very well established. So whether it's Spotify or Netflix or Amazon, and you have very little chance of winning in that environment. And I've had this experience, of course, with my own startup. And so it's difficult. It's not that, you know, these things don't need to be built, but unfortunately, I think that the dominant solutions will be global ones and not just for Africa. I'll put Europe in the same basket. There's been attempts by by some, you know, uh, European uh, companies or countries to, to build a kind of a competitor to Netflix, and this has not worked at all. And they've had to, you know, uh, France in particular, they've had to realize, well, okay, Netflix has won even on our market. So, This is the reality of things. What is it that we could be building in Africa that leverages tech to promote creativity? I don't think that we have the solution yet, but I would suggest a way to approach uh, this question that might be a bit different. We need to think and entrepreneurs need to think when they decide to embark on, uh, you know, building a product, what is it from my own personal environment? So, you know, I'm living in an African country where I have this set of challenges. What is it that I can learn from my immediate set of challenges that can be extrapolated into a solution that works for either the world or other emerging markets? One of the few examples that we've seen, and that's why it's worked so well, has been in fintech with mobile payments. Yes. And this is no surprise that this is really the sector that has worked the best in Africa because this is the real good example of, okay, we're in a market where most people are unbanked. So we're still using cash mostly. This is not secure. This is not practical. And yet everybody has a mobile phone. And so Q creation of mobile money and all other types of fintech solutions. Uh, And now this is like a a leading innovation for the world. If we were to find other problems that the African experience could help solve, whether it is in the creative sector or not, but everything is kind of connected because fintech helps every sector. And the issue of being paid when you're a creator is a very big one. So fintech as applied to the gig economy or the freelancer economy is a very interesting space. This is how I think entrepreneurs should think. This is quite hard because it implies that you have a certain level of understanding of your own situation as opposed to what's going on in other parts of the world. And it's hard to know that if you are not able to travel. So in many cases, African entrepreneurs are at a disadvantage because they might have less access to travel because it's more expensive, their visa issues and all of that. That's really how I think we can find proper solutions that involve tech and that can reach proper success. Another thing that I would say uh, when it comes to the creative sector specifically is to try and look at what are the successful creative sector companies that have emerged in other emerging economies. So Latin America, Middle East, parts of Asia, some of them have had creative sector companies create tech 
companies that have been successful. And then let's look at what are they doing that could be replicable in Africa. And can we get inspired by these companies to find business models that can work on the continent and achieve scale within our conditions? So that's something that I'm personally researching as part of one of the advisory um, missions that I have at the moment for a client. And I think that that would really unlock a lot of new ideas and a lot of new approaches when it comes to how we can collectively grow this ecosystem into something that really starts to generate winners in terms of companies and entrepreneurs. Awesome, awesome. You shared a wealth of knowledge gained, obviously, from your vast experience and also offered advice as to how entrepreneurs can reframe their approach when looking for solutions in tech. So if we look at it from a different perspective, what advice would you give to, say, aspiring filmmakers or content creators who are interested in tapping into the African media or creative industry space? So that's a question I get asked a lot as well. And, uh, and, and I've worked with a lot of African creators, so writers, filmmakers, actors in many different capacities over the past 15 or 20 years. I've built many creative teams as well, which means that I've, you know, selected promising writers, for example, and put them together and run development labs. I did that for Reuters. I did that for my own show, The XYZ Show in Kenya, and, and that's Nigerian version of Goes at the Top. I did that for Trace. I'm doing that for another client in the sports world now, and I've done that for Film One in Nigeria. So I've, I've done that many times. And I would say that this is the gap when it comes to the audiovisual sector in Africa. And I'm not the only one to say this. Netflix would say the same. Is that we're not putting the resources that are adequate in the development segment of that industry. So we're not spending enough time and money to think about the stories we want to tell and to come up with real, well-grounded, realistic characters that are complex, that are not cliche, that feel like real people. And we're not spending enough time to think about what journey they're going to embark on, uh, about their psychology, reaction and their choices, and where they will land. And what are we trying to say through these characters that speaks to the universal human condition? So very often the scripts that go into production across the continent, they have been done in a haste just because of lack of resources, right? The person wants to shoot because they want to try to release, make a bit of money and then go to the next project. And they cannot really afford to spend uh, screenwriters, the amount of time screenwriters uh, spend in the US or in Europe on a script. It's crazy. Sometimes it's three years. So not necessarily or more, not necessarily full time, but still you have to sit stay and sit with a story for that long. Uh, I and myself, I have a project, that's a TV series project that I co-created and that that I co-wrote called The Trade that's been first with Canal Plus and now with Sony. I've been working on it for over 10 years. Oh, wow. So it can get extremely, extremely frustrating, but... I'm not saying 10 years is the right amount of time. Uh, it's not, right? But we need to find a way to channel more resources into, it's it's the equivalent in the industry of the research and development phase. We need to do more research and development on uh, films and TV series. We need to give the space for the creatives to think like that. And we need to give them tools that they may not have picked up from other, from their formal education, because that's not being taught in schools across the continent. They may not have fully understood from what they saw online because it's not enough to read about it, to hear about it. You have to practice it and to come up with deeper stories and characters. I think that's what's missing. Um, To respond to that, Netflix, for example, is organizing development labs. They're even doing a lab that is for development executives. So the person sitting on the side of the buyer, the platform or the studio that works with the writer to help them give birth to that story, because that skill did not used to exist at all in the continent. And now it's happening a little bit because of Netflix, because of Showmax, because of Canal Plus. They're all doing that work. But this is really what's missing, because... There's lots of stories, but so far they have not been told with a level of complexity and depth and time spent on the characters uh, to properly convey the message. We we all know that when we meet people on the continent, they are very often fascinating. This has not yet come through in the content that's been produced mostly. Of course, there's exceptions. 
And I think that that's where we should put our collective efforts. And certainly at my level, that is what I try to explain to anybody who would listen and anybody who wants to be involved in that space. Please put your effort there in the storytelling, in the writers, in the development of the characters and the storylines. Beautifully said, beautifully said, Marie. So it's clear that in order for Africa's creative industry to develop, we need to put in place the required resources to enable that to move forward for the future. So looking at the future, I know this is a very open question, but where do you see Africa's creative industry? Even if we look at one country, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, where do you see Africa's creative industry in the next five years time? Well, there's a lot of things going on behind the curtain that people might not be aware of. So there's a lot of people, I would say that the money problem is almost, and I wouldn't say resolved, but there's now a lot of people with vast pools of money that want to be involved in the space. Um, what they're lacking is investment strategies. That's what I'm helping them with. But also they are looking for companies because very often they don't, they cannot invest in one single person, right? But they're looking at investable companies and entrepreneurs or projects or programs that are uh, well-structured enough that they can accept a, a proper structured investment. And so there's really a, now maybe I'm like opening a call to your listeners. Like if you are somebody who is a project or, or oriented and business oriented person, but with a passion for the, the, the creative industries, there's an opportunity for you uh, to put together ambitious projects that can scale. Uh, it can be, you know, a network of schools. It can be one particular uh, startup that you think can really grow. It can be a shared manufacturing hub for designers to share. You know, there is money to finance these projects now. We don't find the projects in front of them that are well-structured enough to finance. This is where we've reached, which I think is a pretty positive place because before there was just no money and no interest. Now there's the money and the interest. <laughs> and so now we need the other side to kind of um, get their act in order, right? And another thing that I would say, one criticism that investors very often have for the creative sector is that very often the project lead, somebody who will bring a project to an investor, will often be the lead creative. For example, in the fashion sector, it might be the designer. In the music world, it might be the artist themselves, the singer. In the film industry, it might be, you know, the producer. And sometimes that person is not the best person to run the business side of the endeavor. Yes. And for some reason in Africa so far, we have pursued that idea that we needed to train that creative person to become a business person. And so there's been all these workshops and all these trainings to, to train a fashion designer, to build a business and blah, blah, blah. When the skill of that person is to create the product. And why would they need to know how to do everything escapes me because when you look at other markets it is never the case uh, the most um you know the most one of the most valuable companies in the world is LVMH luxury group in France do you really think that all these brands so the Vuittons and the likes they are run by the designer no obviously no. not <laughs> you know the designer has her or his hands full with coming up with the creative vision of the collection and the designs and going into all the details to make it you know the best that it can be they always have a ceo with them running everything else and this is you know the duality that you need to have in this creative or sports businesses right and this has been well understood in developed markets when you look at somebody like rihanna do you think she's the ceo of fenty do you think she's the one looking at the you know the pnls and the projections and asking the accountant hey what about this number you think it's correct or no you know, she has to provide a creative vision. She's the one who had the idea. Um, she is, of course, you know, uh, promoting with her image, the brand, but she has a whole team. So I think we should stop in Africa. This kind of naive idea, which I'm not saying is coming from Africa, but very often it's coming from the development institutions who are organizing these workshops. Uh, and that the lead creative is somehow deficient because they don't know business. Let's let the lead creative be 
the lead creative. And maybe they can be trained on how to better channel their creativity. That is something else because that can be improved as well for everyone. It's a journey, right? But let's match them with proper business people and proper tech people who are masters in their own fields and have an interest in the creative sector, but might not be creative themselves. I happen to think that that software designers and that CEOs are creatives. That's my own view, but they don't need to be the lead creative in the space that this company is operating on. Let's bring these people together and build proper, well-rounded teams that can then take on the world. And that's also the journey that has happened in the tech sector. You were asking me about parallels between the tech sector and the creative sector in Africa. That's what happened. Remember back in the day when there was one founder (laughs) trying to do everything and investors was like, well, You're a tech founder, you really need to find a business co-founder. Or you're a business founder, you really need to find a tech co-founder. It's the same with the creative sector. Let's start building teams that have all the skills necessary to build these businesses. So that is what I'm working on right now. I think this is the step we're in. So if anybody listens to this and is, you know, has a a structured business with with you know a, a proper view on how to turn a creative product into commercial business, I think that they're in a right spot because lots of people are looking for these kind of solutions right now. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. Quote of the week. As people, we often have quotes, mantras, proverbs or affirmations that keep us going when times are challenging or when times are good. Do you have one that you can share with us today? Uh, One that I kind of agree on, and I hope I'm not going to attribute it to the wrong person. I think it's Mandela who said this. Please correct me if it's not true. Uh, Somebody said, I never fail because either I succeed or I learn. Right. Um, So for me, I've never used the word failure. And actually in in business, you cannot, because sometimes that's really the only way that you you learn what you need to succeed the next time. Um, And uh, also we now know, I mean, I hope most people know that the the average age of the successful of an entrepreneur who succeeds uh, is not 20. It's around 40, 45 Um, because, you know, they have learned from their previous failures or successes. And I see this with myself and I see this with the friends of mine, people who have been on the similar journey over the past 20 years. I see them succeed now, whether they are actors or they are entrepreneurs, and I see how they have learned and they are in their 40s. I'm, I'm 41 now and, and reaching peak level in terms of their expertise. And I, I think this is beautiful, but really there's nothing you can really fail because then you'll just learn something. Uh, yeah. So I would say that that is something that uh, describes the way that I approach life and career. I agree. The only way that you fail is when you give up. That is true as well, but I agree. But I would also say, because I'm somebody who used to never give up, uh, sometimes you also have to recognize when you're hitting a wall and you're maybe not in the right direction, right? That is also true. (laughs) So not not give up in spirit, but learn also if like you're just going in the wrong direction, it's just not sticking, maybe pivot. Yes, yes, I agree 100%. (laughs) So... We've come to the end of today's conversation, which has been a fantastic conversation. I was wondering, do you have any closing remarks or final calls to action for people who are interested in Africa's creative industry, media industry, or interested in the work that you do? Well, I think I've said it, but really I would love for people to engage. Uh, so the easiest way to engage with me is on LinkedIn at my full name, uh, Marie Laura Mungai. I'm quite active on there. I post a lot about the creative and sports sector. Uh, always happy to you know, see people comment and stuff. Uh, I'm not able to respond to individual requests, but when I can connect somebody or give a quick feedback or sometimes you know, I receive a question and then I answer through a post or my newsletter, Uh, I'm happy to do that. So yeah, if you recognize yourself in the profile of the type of opportunities and entrepreneur that I mentioned that I think is what's missing right now, don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, yeah, I'm overall very optimistic. So I would encourage everybody to continue on their journey and continue to improve what they're working on and their craft and to not give up, as you said. Fantastic. That's been a great conversation. Extremely enlightening, educational. It's been a long time coming and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you for joining us today, Marie. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. 
My pleasure. And thank you for your insightful questions. And I'm uh, very glad to have had this conversation with you as well. Brilliant, brilliant. And we will keep in touch and speak soon. Looking forward to seeing all the great things that you continue doing in the creative industries or space in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you to everyone who has listened and stayed tuned to the podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, share or tell a friend about it. You can also rate review us in Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast. Thank you and see you next week for the Unlocking Africa podcast. Unlocking Africa.